Well, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here in Montana. Um, as uh, Dr. Holly noted, I'm uh, from Washington, D.C. I teach at George Washington University, and I'm the uh, head of medical planning and preparedness for the International Medical Corps, which is an NGO that does medical and public health response to disasters, complex emergencies, uh, and human conflicts around the world. Uh, I haven't talked to Dr. Kim about this yet, but I'm actually thinking of uh, inventing what I'm going to call the reverse honorarium, uh, where speakers uh, get to pay the hosts of uh, conferences like this that actually give them the chance to get out of Washington, D.C. So very nice to be here today. Going to talk about a bit of a difficult subject today. It's uh, medical and public health preparedness for large-scale disasters. So we're going to start with the opening query as a rhetorical question. And the question is simple. Are disasters increasing in their frequency and scope of scale of impact? How many people in the audience believe that they are? OK. Just a couple of people shout out. What do you think is the reason why disasters are increasing? I'm sorry? Climate change. Almost always the number one answer to this query. Uh, but it's, it's true, but it, it's not the simple question or, or, or response that I'm going to focus on uh, for the purpose of answering this. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of factual, that is empirically based, uh, contributors to this notion of disasters increasing uh, in their frequency and scope of scale of impact. By the way, I'm a medical planner. Uh, I was raised in the Department of Defense, specifically the Navy, uh, as a planner addressing health service support requirements for operational forces. Subsequently, after leaving the Navy, I've done a lot of planning around, uh, as mentioned, some very high-end threats, smallpox, uh, nuclear terrorism, uh, pandemic influenza, et cetera. So when I look at this uh, question, uh, there's four reasons why I would say that they are increasing in their frequency and scope of scale of impact. Number one, since 1918 and 1919, which is the date of the Spanish influenza, the greatest disease event in human history. Thought to have killed more than 100 million people worldwide. Uh, the attack rate at the time was 50% of the entire human population living on the globe at that time. Since then, our population has increased threefold. We're up to 7 billion people. In the parlance of medical planners, that simply means I have a bigger population at risk or par that are at risk of events that could happen to them from the all hazard spectrum, I'm talking any type of disaster or disease event. Number two, more than 50% of the human population right now lives within 50, uh, 60 kilometers of an ocean on the littorals. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that they're putting themselves in harm's way for at least three different types of disasters. Seismological disasters, because the tectonic plate edges are on those littorals, hydrological disasters, and meteorological disasters, because most of those all occur right along the coastlines. They're the, the areas that are most greatly affected by the types of major storms, disasters, and earthquakes that we see happening on a routine annual basis throughout the world. Third, 75% of the world's megacities are also located by the sea. This term, megacities, by the way, that's a new term in the human lexicon. In fact, it, it's thought to have come out around 1971 to describe cities where we had at least a million people living in them. Now, what does that mean? And by the way, in 71, a million people in a single city, that was a big city. I'm from New York City. We have 20 million people living in New York City at this point. What that talks to is the notion of clustering, a public health term where people are jammed in into tight demographics, and what are they doing to the critical infrastructure that has to support them? They're putting it on an extreme burden. I would suggest, too, as Malcolm Gladwell will say, that it also puts them as a tipping point, that the minute something happens, it pushes them over the, the edge and causes the event to cascade, exacerbating the disaster. And if that wasn't enough, there's a single inexorable truth about the spread of disease. Dr. R.S. Bray, a British uh, medical historian, wrote this wonderful book, Armies of Pestilence, The Impact of Disease Upon History, which, if anybody's interested in epidemiology or infectious disease, I would absolutely suggest that you put this on the reading list. He notes that one inexorable truth, as I said, exists regarding the spread of disease throughout time immemorial, and that is, it will always travel along man's lines of communications. That term is a military euphemism for man's lines of transportation, meaning in any way that a disease event can, can spread or move by the current modalities that are used to get people from point A to point B, it's going to leverage it. And you can track that going all the way back to the Black Plague of 1346 and 47, for example, and certainly track it really well 
during the 1918 and 1919 outbreak, when maritime and rail travel, both intercontinentally and intracontinentally, were responsible for the spread of the disease. Well, why is this worrisome? Since 1918 and 1919, what have we had? We'd have the introduction of the global airline transportation system. Now we have concerns that those little silver tubes that fly around the world every day, whose contrails we see when we walk outside into the big sky country here in Montana, are, are little silver tubes that have the potential to spread disease around the world in an exponentially fast fashion. If we had small arithmetic progressions in 1918 and 1919 that, that coursed the disease over 18 months with three separate waves, the thinking now is that if it's facilitated by air travel, we could have hypersped waves that could reach the entire global population within hours. Not months, not years, hours. So this notion of, 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 of Bray and his point about the spread of disease has to be paid attention to in an era where we're seeing more and more emerging infectious diseases, SARS, MERS-CoV, the Zika virus. All of these are events that, Ebola, that we had not previously seen that if leveraging air travel could be extremely problematic. So before I go any further, let me make an attempt to make some semantic deconfliction so we kind of set the stage for this. These are hazards, okay? On the left, you'll see a hurricane, you'll see a tornado, major flooding, uh, that's a volcano in the middle, and on the right are the disasters that could occur as a result of them. Are those two different? Are hazards different from disasters? Absolutely. In fact, the UN right now, in the last couple of years, since 2012, says there's no such thing as a natural disaster. How's that for a paradigm-shifting thought? Kind of out of the box, right? No such thing as a natural disaster, only natural hazards. What they say is that disasters can often follow a natural hazard, they, the disasters occur when we don't take the time to prepare, which is at the core of this presentation. Their severity is entirely dependent on the choices we make for our lives, property, and environment. That talks to the notion of it being an individual responsibility, a bottoms-up requirement for preparedness for every one of us to take on. Because most of us labor under the impression that if big bad things happen, who's gonna come and rescue us? It's gonna be government, right? Well, I could go into a much longer lecture about the myth of the federal response, but the assets aren't as big and as real as you think they are. So preparedness really begins at the base level of the family unit in the community. Third or fourth, every decision we make can either enhance our posture of preparedness or conversely degrade it, but it requires a decision. We have to embrace the notion of being ready. Said another way for all of these things, disasters occur at the confluence of where hazards meet vulnerabilities. And out of those two terms, hazards and vulnerabilities, which, are the ones that, which is the one that we could do something about? It's the vulnerabilities, right? That's what we have to look at addressing. So with all of that as background, if we remember a kind of buzzword or phrase from the 1960s from a popular magazine, MAD, remember Alfred E. Newman used to say, what me worry? This actually had the context of the era that that magazine came out in. Does everybody, has anybody ever thought of why Alfred E. Newman on the cover every month used to ask, what, me worry? He was talking about the concerns of the Cold War. In fact, there, there's sort of an urban legend over the fact that MAD, as the magazine, actually stood for mutually assured destruction. And its whole job was to poke satire at, at, at the risk we were living under the sword of Damocles on a daily basis. So, we, we, we need to worry nowadays. The emergency management community, mostly at the federal level, but at the state as well, is keeping a very close eye on what we call the big seven US catastrophic scenarios. Because it's the stuff that a planner can be kept up at night about. And if you haven't thought about these or seen these before, these are the big seven. The Cascadia subduction zone, which is a major earthquake along the fault lines of the Pacific Northwest. The San Andreas Fault, its counterpart in the Southwest. The New Madrid Fault, which runs down the Mississippi, which is thought, if it goes off, could literally separate the country in half. Uh, an earthquake in New Madrid went off, I think, around 1864. It actually reversed the, the direction of the Mississippi River when it occurred. And the concern now is that if it happens, it will disrupt the transportation lines between the east and west of the country. You folks live five hours from what is probably the biggest threat in the world today, and that's the Yellowstone Caldera. How many people in the room are familiar with that? 
Try and catch the Discovery Channel show about this one, right? It's really good. A 40 by 60 mile caldera with a 500 mile deep magna chamber. And if you've ever watched some of the Hollywood movies about the meteor strikes, they use the term Ellie to describe this scenario. Does anybody know what Ellie means? Extinction level event. This is the big one, okay? Because if it goes off, it's thought that it could, it could cause the equivalent of nuclear winter. With, with so much being propelled into the atmosphere, we'd lose the chance to have sunlight, all of the plant life would die, and subsequently humans would follow. Pandemic influenza. Globally, this is probably the big bad ugly. And I'll go into this a little more in a few minutes about the numbers and what this represents. And then on the terrorism side, a widespread anthrax dispersion and a 10 kT nuke, uh, improvised nuclear device going off in one of our major metropolitan areas. Community levels, we plan for disasters and calamitous events that involve 10 patients from a major, major motor vehicle accident. We plan for, for large-scale industrial accidents. What we plan for in these scenarios have casualty loads that run into the millions, in some cases the hundreds of millions. And yet these are completely plausible scenarios that we're worried about are pretty much every day. And at the core of this presentation, what I want to try and get across to you is that of the 18 defined critical infrastructure and key resource sectors that have been uh, enumerated by the Department of Homeland Security, the single one that will bear the greatest preponderant load in adjudicating either the success or conversely the failure of our incident management efforts is going to be the medical and public health sector. In 1997, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff made the first attempt at defining what we called then consequence management. We don't use that term of art anymore. We use the term incident management now to be compliant with the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System. But if you look at the definition, it still applies. Look at the key words. Save lives, reduce suffering, mitigate further harm from an affected population. So the second rhetorical question in my presentation, of all of the critical infrastructure sectors, agriculture, transportation, energy, food production, which one is going to be the, the, the one that takes on the biggest load when bad stuff happens? My argument is it's medical and public health. What's the common denominator to all disasters? Casualties. So for the purpose of the time that I had here, because I had another 48 slides in this presentation, we're going to take an operational pause. And I'm just going to give you a couple of three minutes of an elevator speech on this stuff. Common denominator to all disasters, human casualties. We have inculcated our population to do what when bad stuff happens. They go after the big white H on the blue background, right? When you're hurt, you're sick, and you need support, succor, aid, you're going to a hospital, right? And yet the hospitals are arguably the least prepared critical infrastructure sector in the entire United States. Why? Well, I can explain this very easily. In this country, it's a product of managed care. We've turned hospital beds into profit centers. If the beds aren't filled, the hospitals close. The CEO gets fired. The board, in some cases, gets rid of the hospital. So that equates to the fact that we have zero surge. That's the big, big buzzword in my world. Surge capacity, availability, and planning. What are we going to do to plus up with hospital beds and, and the accompaniment of, of personnel that can treat a sudden influx, a large influx of patients? Give an example of how bad this is. In Washington, D.C., where I live, arguably the number one threat location in the United States, Washington Hospital Center, has a surge load on any given day of 247% above capacity. It's a 60-hour wait from a presentation at the ER to admission to a bed if you show up at that hospital. So what happens if something bad happens in DC when we suddenly have this influx of patients that are going to require support? That infrastructure is not going to be ready for it. We are siloed in the healthcare community to the day-to-day -day delivery of healthcare in the patient, the single patient, single provider relationship. We are not working in the paradigm of for greater good, which is the classic public health paradigm, where we're thinking about community-based preparedness and community-based resilience. So the concern is, unless we change this current paradigm, that healthcare infrastructure under the weight of these aforementioned events is going to completely collapse, at which point we're going to have trouble. We're going to have serious trouble in our communities. So here's Margiela's Law. And I know this is a little hubristic, but I've been doing this stuff for 30 years. And, and have done a lot of publishing on, 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 on this topic and readiness and how we can enhance our, our, our posture of preparedness in this country. 
And here's what I've come up with. This all comes down to pre-event deliberate planning. Deliberate planning is a term of art born out of the Department of Defense to describe planning for an event that is essentially a predictable surprise, something we see coming, war in Iraq, war in North Korea, war in Iran, so that when it actually happens, we're ready. Well, those same principles can be applied to our readiness planning to enhance our posture of preparedness if we engaged in it. But we don't, because we are a culture, a complete society of nearly perfect knee-jerk reactivity. We are not a culture of proactivity that leans forward when bad stuff is ready to happen. I'm a retired Navy guy, sailor, love to tell sea stories. Here's a two-second one. In 2004, we thought Al-Qaeda had gotten a hold of what we called man-portable nuclear devices, or the infamous suitcase nukes. So we went into the first White House-directed crisis action planning evolution to produce the, the catastrophic incident response plan, which was essentially a medical and public health-centric plan for dealing with the casualties of this event. 13 hours after the White House had declared that cap, I walked into FEMA with the director of operations, and we were, it's one o'clock in the morning, we're walking by the mezzanine when their command center is, and I look inside, and it's empty, save two people. One is the battle captain, who's got the watch, and the other's a janitor. And I look at Eric Tolbert, the director of operations, and I said, you gotta be kidding me. Why isn't Mr. Brown, then the administrator, the infamous administrator, why hasn't he stood up the watch to be ready for what we are thinking might be inevitable, inevitable at this point? And Mr. Tolbert turned to me and he said, this you should never forget. This is emblematic of the culture of knee-jerk reactivity. Until we change this, we will never get ahead of the event. And all you have to do is look at Katrina, 9-11, and Sandy to, to know that that's true. My colleague, Dr. David Campbell, uh, and I were invited to speak in plenary at the American College of Healthcare Executives one year after 9-11. And David, who had been the CEO of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York, the primary casualty receiving site for the World Trade Center's casualties if they'd ever come, made this point, jabbing his finger at the, at the collection, the, the biggest collection of C-suite leadership in the United States of our hospitals. And he says, you folks didn't get it. He says, 9-11 should be viewed as a catastrophic casualty anomaly in that more people died than were casualties requiring critical care support. And he said, had the reverse been true, we would have busted the surge capacity of our healthcare infrastructure from Boston to Washington, D.C., if we could have married them to transportation platforms to get there. And I argue that had that been true, had the reverse of that anomaly been true, the entire findings of the 9-11 Commission would have been different, and it would have been completely focused on our healthcare infrastructure, saying that's got to be fixed, because there's the Achilles heel. This is the new reality. This is page two of the Washington Post, one day after the Blacksburg shooting at Virginia Tech. And I offer this as an example, if you could read it, and I'm very close to the end here, if you could read it, there was four hospitals in the greater Blacksburg area, and they ranged from 146 beds to 521 beds. These are modern, well-equipped, completely up to speed hospitals, and one of them was a tier one trauma facility, or a level one trauma facility. Day after the event, they reported, we don't know if we could have ever been prepared. It was so overwhelming. It could paralyze hospitals. You know what the casualty load between those five hospitals were? 24 patients. So I asked this question, third rhetorical question of the presentation, what if that was 240 patients? Or 2,400 patients? 24,000 patients? Or 240,000 patients, which is still on the low ends of those scenarios? that I talked about here. If this couldn't serve as a wake-up call, even after 9-11, I don't know what can. But we have to embrace readiness. Dr. Huntsman last night talked about the notion that we have to invest in our, what's the term he used? Uh, he said, we, we have to invest in prevention to change the current healthcare paradigm and the vast amounts of money we would waste. From my perspective, I say we have to invest in preparedness. And it has to be a, a, in advance of these events that we expect could actually happen. Because hazards are sure to occur. I purposefully picked three covers from National Geographic that depict natural hazards, not terrorism. These are events that occur every year in, in routine seasonal bases. 
they're sure to occur as surely as the sun will come up tomorrow. There was a gentleman who approached uh, John Barry, who wrote the, the Great Influenza, fantastic book if you've never read it, on the 1918-1919 pandemic. And he walked up to him at the Institute of Medicine when they were talking about H5N1, and he said, you know, the clock is ticking. We just don't know what time it is. And I thought that was a really cool ending to a presentation like this for years and years, and that's what I would end with this with. And then you said, I said to myself, you know what? That's not true. I know exactly what time it is. It's really always 9-11. We know what time it is. It's just like that beautiful clear morning on September 11th. It's 8.45. What's 8.45? One minute before the, plane hit, the first plane hit the South Tower. None of us in this room know when we are one minute away from the next calamitous event. But I could almost guarantee you that it's going to occur. Whether it's natural or man-made is almost a moot point. Two quotes. The second being my favorite. This is what I've devoted my life and my career to. I'd rather prepare our citizens than warn them. Bad stuff will happen. We have to be ready. Some references, I'm happy to make this presentation available to you and my contact information. Thank you for your time.